All right. Well, let's start with your sporting background. What were you? What What do you do now? And what have you done in the past? I'll um, give you. I'm 43 years of age now. Um, so I think we're birthday birthday twins, aren't we? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, that's good. Um, so yeah, basically, I'll give you the whistle stop tour. Started off like most kids from the northwest playing a bit of football. Dabbled with a bit of rugby and things going through school um, under the encouragement of uh, my old Welsh PE teacher, Lester Flavin. Um, got a little bit of a bug for rugby, but at the time in the UK, it was the first real exposure to uh, mixed martial arts. You know, the early UFCs had a very good friend who was very into that. He used to travel around the country trying to find like anywhere to train. So when he came back, we used to uh, practice on each other. We used to get the old Gracie, Gracie instructionals because there was nowhere to train at the time. Um, very different now. So did a little bit of wrestling, a um, little bit of MMA style training without ever really competing. Did a few wrestling tournaments, but to no, no really high level. Um, but I'd always been fascinated with kind of just physicality, really, be like combat sports, rugby. Um, I was always moderately obsessed with just trying to get as big and strong as possible um, within the background of trying to apply that to sports. So, you know, I spent a lot of my kind of teenage years in the gym, um, speaking to the big guys, trying to get advice, whether some of it was good or bad. Who knows? Um, well, actually, most of it probably then was quite bad. Um, and so, <laughs> you know, the the Internet has its advantages nowadays in terms of being able to get access to experts as long as you know what an expert looks like. Probably a different conversation for a different time. So then decided um, after a few years working in engineering, um, you know, I come from quite a, an engineering based family. Um, did a few years doing that sort of stuff, had a couple of life events where it just really made me reflect upon where I was at sort of my early 20s and thought, is this how I want to spend the rest of my life? You know, working in a factory or putting rivets in holes or doing electronics and stuff like that. I was like, not really. Um, so I decided to go off to university, did an undergraduate degree in sports science, which then, you know, played a bit of rugby, kept on with the wrestling a little bit which then led to a master's degree in uh, sports injury and rehabilitation. I wanted to do a sports nutrition or sports or S&C master's, but other places were full at the time because there was an issue with my application, as in it got lost. So I'm not going to name the university, but thanks for that. Uh, and then from there, you know, the strength training continued, the wanting to get bigger continued, the wrestling kind of continued, and eventually got offered a PhD in Cardiff University in clinical biomechanics. Um, so healthcare sciences, clinical biomechanics, which combined kind of like movement analysis with strength work, with some physiology stuff and um, physiotherapy and a bit of kind of imaging MRI analysis type work as well. And then when I moved to Cardiff, really, that's when I got really into the kind of, I guess, the sort of real subculture around bodybuilding. You know, there's a lot of top bodybuilders from that part of the world. Flex Lewis at the time, uh, multiple Mr. Olympia. Um, and so I ended up working in a supplement shop part time obsession with bodybuilding became and getting bigger and more jacked became more uh, to the to the forefront of my goal. So transitioned from wrestling into kind of bodybuilding and powerlifting, both of which I was distinctly average at um, never won anything, never placed at anything. But I did learn a lot about maximizing my own genetic potential, I guess. And so it was during a time I was uh, completing my PhD, started my first business, which was basically an education and content writing company to earn a bit of cash on the side. And then from that, obviously, you write a lot of content, you become more educated, you then start people inquiring about your services in terms of not just the content aspect, but, oh, I'm doing this program or I'm doing this nutrition approach. Can you give me some support? And from that tiny little acorn did a, well, maybe not quite a mighty oak, but a performance consultancy business kind of grew to the point now where I've downsized considerably, not that maybe you can or can't tell. So my biggest, I was around 120 kilos. I'm now down at a, a Svel 88 trying to be one of these hybrid athlete things, which is all the rage these days. So I now, I say run ultra marathons. I now survive ultra marathons and I'm trying to stay moderately jacked, moderately strong uh, in the process and trying to balance those things with um, establishing my my new business in, in London, which is kind of how we met. So I think that's where I'm at now. I think that's yeah. a pretty good whistle stop tour. What was your most recent ultra? How, how long was it? Where was it? So my most recent ultra um was the it was the race to the king i did two uh not this summer just gone the summer before which was 100 kilometers um I, it was one of, it was during the summer it was like the hottest summer in like the history yeah. of mankind um in fact that was two summers ago um and it was just awful conditions being a bigger guy as well like hydration and nutrition just becomes infinitely more important the bigger you are that's my bias my that's my excuse and i'm sticking with it so yeah i got through that i think it was about 18 and a bit hours um, I actually had an attempt this year. So I've kind of stepped away from racing now as a such. I'm more obsessed with 
fastest known times, which is basically like you choose courses and then you you sort of can do it in different ways. You can be supported. So it could be part of a race or there's like aid stations or you can have a support crew with you. Um, but I like, cause I'm, I'm relatively big for an ultra runner. Well, I'm very big for an ultra runner. Um, what my strength is, is my strength. So I've got really started to kind of, uh, get into this idea of what are called fastest known times, which are basically, there's a website called FK, FKT.com, I think. And they've got these like designated trails all over the world. And you can like register your, G, your, your sort of GPX file, your GPS data with them. And my last attempt was actually, I tried to do the whole length of the River Thames, which is 184 miles from source to sea, um, completely unsupported, which means that you take all your own food, all your own shelter, wild camp along the way. You can use like public water access points and toilets. Um, but obviously, you know, you've got the Thames there as well. So you have to have like filter bottles and stuff with you. Unfortunately, that attempt got to about 66 miles in. And at around about 3 a.m. in the morning, somewhere near Oxford, I had to tap out because we had... I don't know if you remember a couple of months ago, it was the end of May, purposely choose that weekend, not too hot, usually dry. And we had like four days of torrential rain. And basically, all you know, you're only as good as your gear in that kind of environment. And my gear failed miserably. So that was um that was my last attempt at something. But my last completed race before that was the the hundred K the um the year before. So I've done okay. upwards of hundred miles before, but that was nice. yeah, a good while ago. Yeah. You can never predict the weather in the UK, can you? well you just even then it's sort of like with that kind of event because weight is so important you're sort of trying to pack for you're trying to pack for the conditions but you're also kind of trying to pack for the most optimistic conditions that you can have and yeah. um, the irony is is no one's actually as i understand it to this date done it fully unsupported so even if i had gone in like full hiking gear and just taken four days to do it um it would have still been a record as far as I'm aware. But for me, I wanted, there's a, there's another record, which is self-supported, which means you can stop in hotels and things along the way, use shops. So unsupported, you can't have like any support, can't use hotels, McDonald's, nothing. You just have to be in the wilderness. Can't even have a friend say hello to you if you were doing it to the strictest letter of the law. Um, So someone did it self-supported in sort of three days and a few hours. So my goal was to beat that. And, you know, because I figured it was possible. Um, But yeah, the Thames, the Thames won on that occasion, but it will be, I'll be, iron that up next year if i can just find the time to dedicate to training training time at the moment is is challenging with how busy i am yeah uh, one of the questions I've, I've been asking on here a lot is like why do you why do you compete in high rocks is, is is the normal question like why why do you do it what motivates you but what's your what's your why for doing these things that's a really good question i think that i think it's, it's a difficult one to answer and that when i when i draw it back when i pull on that sort of I guess that ball of wool that is our existence, trying to pull, find one thread, that little starting thread. I think for me, it was from a very young age. I like, I enjoyed sport. I enjoyed physicality. And I can't, again, I can't, beyond that point, I can't say what it is. And the common thread through everything I've done in my life, whether it's been uh, academic, whether it's been business, whether it's been physical, I've always wanted to know where my limits are. And I think when you tie that in with my identity, always being tied in with sports, like one of my earliest memories was playing football. I was quite a good footballer when I was a kid. Um, was the fact I remember when I was at junior school being allowed an afternoon off school to go and play football with like older kids in a tournament. So even from a very young age, even though I was academically, you know, above average, um, I always remember that being like part of my identity, like physicality was part of my identity. You know, to my friends, I was always like you know, big Paul, big Rimmer, my surname's Rimmer. Um, so obviously, you know, that come with its own mockery as growing up, but it is what it is. <laughs> Um, but like, you know, even now it's funny, like ironically, even though we're in our forties and all my friends are growing up cause I've lost so much size for my biggest, like my friends call me like skinny rimmer now, which is kind of ironic. Cause I'm like, you know, bigger than most dudes. Um, so yeah, I think that if you look at it from that perspective, um, I think it's just, it's always been a part of my identity, but that's always been fascinated with the reality that I've never really been the best at stuff. I've been good at things, but never the best. So I've always been fascinated with like maximizing and optimizing my potential, um, which when you're younger and you don't have the rationale to realize there's always going to be someone bigger, faster, stronger out there than you, unless you happen to be, you know, one of the top guys in the world. Right. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, your ego sort of ties in with that as well, especially being a frustrated teenager. Like, you know, I used to have and like I literally I remember when I first started wrestling, like if I lost a tournament and I did something silly or even if I lost a spar in training or somebody went to like an open mat and someone caught me with something, I would obsess about it for weeks. Not like you know, and I mean, not sleeping. And so I've always had that kind of 
that's calmed as I've got older. Maybe that's wisdom. Maybe it's just tiredness. I don't know. Um, but I think that, yeah, that, that's been always been a part of my identity is that ability to kind of push yourself, but intrinsically just being linked to being good at sports and that being a value that's been imposed on me. You know, even when I was like 10, 11 years of age, I used to go and visit my cousins dotted around the country. And when we go out to play football with their friends and stuff, my cousins would always be like, oh, this is Paul. He's going to go and play for Liverpool. I'm a massive Liverpool fan for my sins. So like even then it was weird. And I've got, I've still got to this day, like a program from, I think it was like an under 12 um, football it was a cup final. We won, started me sub, came on, scored two goals, rescued the game. That's all I'm saying. Right. <laughs> but, um, but uh, it, you know, it said like, you know, Paul, Paul Rimmer, like we've run through a brick wall, quick, powerful, strong forward. So even from that very early age, you start to get categorized as this kind of this kind of figure. And and it, and it suited the way that I played football, it suited the way that I played rugby. I was uh, finesse wasn't a word that you would often associate with me. Um so yeah, that's that's kind of I think when when that gets fed into your identity and then as you get older, that then gets amplified and then you start to amplify it yourself and it becomes a bit sort of like self-perpetuating. Yeah. Um so yeah, I think that kind of okay. interesting. All right. Um so uh we connected, like 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 you said, I, ca- I came to you for some lactate threshold testing, really. But can you sort of tell us high level about the work that, that you're doing now in that space? Yeah, so Athlete Lab, which is how we met, is a, a fairly recent iteration of stuff I've been doing previously. So I had a bricks and mortar business up in Leeds, which was Nexus Performance. Um, decided to get rid of that for a number of different reasons, which I won't bore you with. Some were business decisions, some were personal decisions. And... In this line of work, you know, the, it's an unfortunate, and I say this as a northerner who feels like a traitor almost, it's unfortunate like there's a lot more money in London to do what I was doing. I had connections down here. I was already, you know, working with some reasonable high-level athletes, again, mostly in the combat sports arena, but I've worked with uh, kind of high-level athletes in other sports. But, you know, sometimes you pigeonhole yourself and sometimes you just get pigeonholed. And obviously, if you start working with one client in a specific, particular area, then they tend to talk to their friends. And so, yeah, when I moved to London to set up Athlete Lab, um, that came with the, I guess, the safety net that I was already working with a couple of professional uh, boxers in 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 London. So um, I've got a few fighters dotted around the UK, but I'm mostly based on where I am now, which is uh, Ben Davidson's gym in Harlow in Essex. So there's a few guys there that I work with where, Although Athlete Lab is just pure physiology, profiling, I guess, consultation and strategy stuff, here is a bit more of my, I guess this is kind of like, um, what would you call it? This is like, this is like my, my. Uh, this is the bit of my job that like demands most of my time, but it's also the one which kind of is sort of essential to kind of as a proving ground to know that you're doing so that when you do, you know, talk about things. But one of the things I was conscious with with Athlete Lab is like, I didn't want it to be about me. Um, I wanted it to stand on its own two feet as like a product or a service so that I can scale that as a business. Because one of the things that had happened was I was getting in so much demand, you know, which isn't a bad thing, by the way, with the fighters that I work with here. And, you know, like there was a picture one of my athletes took the other day and there was five people in the picture, like three of them I'm working with and three of them are Olympians. Right. So it's like kind of cool to be in an environment where you're working with that level of athlete. But because they know me, they trust me. I'm here a lot. I do like everything for them, like everything aside from their boxing stuff. So, you know, Ben, Barry and Lee take care of the boxing and the strategy side of things. And then they they give me the privilege and pleasure, I guess, to take care of everything else. Not with every fighter in the gym, but with a, a few of them. So, um, you know, I've got like Pat McCormack, who's a silver medalist in 2020, Shabazz Masood, who's uh, won a few titles now and is fighting for a world title in, I think, November. It's not been signed yet. Royston Barney-Smith, who's one of the youngest pros to be signed under Frank Warren. Um, and he's just won the WBA Youth so in terms of athletes that I work with now, that's the kind of caliber of, caliber of people that I'm working with. Um, and yeah, a few, couple of up and coming pros. And so those guys keep me busy. So with the athlete lab stuff, I, I've got a couple of other people that work with me there that so I can scale that business so that when I'm hopefully jet setting off around the world supporting these fighters, because I do everything from their strength and conditioning work, running programming work. And um, the only thing I don't really do with them is their rehabilitation stuff if they've got any injuries, but I will refer out for that. And even their um, like all their nutrition, all their weight cutting. So as you can imagine, for example, October, I'm away or not able to work in terms of the athlete lab stuff for basically 20 days that month um, because because of that. So, yeah, that's the kind of caliber of athlete I'm working with at the moment. But I've worked with what you would call world class athletes in a number of sports since around about 2014, 2015, which is mad that that's like 10 years ago now because it seems to have gone 
gone like that. And so the athlete lab stuff that you're doing, like the, can you talk about like the, the types of testing that, that you do and like maybe some of the, the, the potential benefits of testing for that? Yeah, cool. So at Athlete Lab, we specialize really in sort of four main things. So one is lactate testing and which is what we've done. We can dig into these in a little bit more depth. Fundamentally, if I was to break that down into its simplest thing, what that's going to do is it's going to tell you your metabolic profile and how that relates to the specific training zones that you need to be in. So we use that to determine training zones. Zones kind of one to five is the classic way of doing that. And a bit more accurately than just using kind of heart rate data, which is how it would most normally be done. There are other methods out there, but that's how most people will have become familiarized with it. And I'm sure most people who've tried to use heart rate data to look at their zones sometimes find there's um, a big difference, particularly at the lower intensity zones as well. Um, and there's reasons for that we can dig into if you wish. Um, and then the other option, the other option, the other thing that we add, which is VO2 max, maximal oxygen uptake. So the way to think about this is maximal oxygen uptake is like having the engine in your car. It's the size of your engine. Lactate is more like how well you use the gears within that engine and like where your power zones are. And we can profile an athlete to say, okay, well, you've got this bigger zone here and that's good for your sport, but maybe this zone's a little bit weak. So we can target training to create the adaptations and stimuluses within those zones. VO2 max, we can do similar with um, in terms of just being able to profile an athlete. For example, if a fighter comes with to me and they want to be a world level fighter and they haven't got a VO2 max over a specific number, chances are they're either going to have to do some work or it ain't going to happen. You know, like it's not the biggest determinant of performance, but it's still there's still certain thresholds where I could be more or less confident in an athlete's ability to, to stand up to the physical demands, even within a skill based sport. Um, so then the other two things we really do with that is resting metabolic rate te testing and nutrition consultancy. Um, so that's basically we just look at overall metabolic function, how many calories you burn at rest. We do a bit of a lifestyle kind of profile and some sort of more detailed nutrition analysis to be able to identify kind of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities for improvement, whether that's from a, an athletic performance perspective. But I also have a number of clients that are fascinated with longevity and with um, like what you might call performance work, workplace based performance, you know, like a lot of executives, high, high, high level, high functioning people who have a lot of stress, a lot of pressure. And what they're looking to do is treat themselves almost like an intellectual athlete is probably a nice way of looking at it. So they want to be like, right, I want to be at it at work, eating correctly to fuel performance, no energy slumps, making better decisions, not making mistakes that I make um, and trying to you know do as I doing as I say, not as that I necessarily do all the time. And then the final thing really is body composition profiling, where we use like an ultrasound, um, to, which is just a, it's not the gold standard method of doing body composition, but it correlates quite highly with that as well. So that's the kind of four main things that we do. Physiology, tech, which is in two broad categories, physiology kind of testing profile and strategy, and then sort of nutrition profiling and, and strategy as well. Okay. All right. Great. So uh, if we if we just focus on like the lactate stuff uh, for now, which I think... I mean, obviously, I came to you for, for that purpose for my high rocks performance, and I think it's relevant for people wanting to perform in high rocks, like a, a sixty to ninety minute, you know, on average sort of activity. Yeah, yeah. Um, why why do we want to know our lactate thresholds? Like, what's the, in your opinion, what's what's the benefit of determining that? And uh, and we and maybe we in a minute we'll get into the ways of determining that. And like, it's I should say, like for people listening. You don't necessarily have to come to pool no, no, to course. get testing. Like there's other ways to determine that, but what, why? Why would we want to know those thresholds? So I think that there's there's people. Sometimes people come for testing. I take a, step, a slight step backwards first. People come for testing and think that like one test is going to give them all of the answers. And um, what it will do is give you a good template for saying, okay, here's some strengths that you have, and here's some weaknesses that you have. Okay. And does your metabolic profile, by metabolic profile, what I'm talking about here is like, how does your body access energy systems? So what lactate is effectively telling us is how quickly or slowly and at what intensities or effort levels your body is accessing kind of higher intensity energy system, which is normally the kind of breakdown of like glucose or carbohydrate, either, you know, well, in the, in the storage form in the body, which is in glycogen, which is in the liver and in the muscles. Now, in some sports, you might want people to be able to access that energy system quicker. So, for example, if I've got someone who's a sprinter or a power sport athlete, I want them to be able to produce lactate quickly because what that tells me is that their body 
is going into that energy system quickly. But why would I want someone to go into that energy system quickly? The answer to that is this beautiful little thing called ATP, which is adenosine triphosphate. That's the body's energy currency. And what happens is, is the more energy demand that we place on the body, the faster the rates of ATP we have to resynthesize. We only store so much in the body. Stored as ATP, it's broken down into ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. And basically, when we metabolize energy, what we're doing is reattaching that phosphate from ADP to make it back to ATP. And in that process of donating the phosphate, we're allowing things like muscle contractions to take place. So the more energy we need for more muscle contractions, i.e. working at higher intensities, higher effort levels, the quicker we need to go through that ADP, ATP cycle to regenerate ATP. So why is that important for lactate profiling? Well, if someone's got a fast rate of lactate, it means that they are producing ATP very, very quickly. Um, and that's because that me that's because we produce ATP faster from glycogen and glucose sources than we do from fatty acids. Now, in an endurance profile, what we don't want to do is people depleting their glycogen really early on. So we want to kind of push that curve to the right hand side, if you can imagine. So the profile that we're looking at and one of the advantages of testing is I can tell you what kind of profile you have as an athlete. And if it's like, you know, for example, for high rocks, if you were operating at a really low effort and you're already, you know, showing signs of increased lactate levels, that would mean that you're accessing that glycogen glucose store type energy system. And therefore we'd need to be like, okay, well, is that a fueling issue? Is that a training issue? How do we stop you depleting those things? Cause they're a finite resource in the body. So if I've got a strength or power athlete, I don't want them not being able to turn on their ATP tap. I want them to be able to turn that on quickly. And so when we're going high intensity, high power, the quicker that comes on, generally speaking, the better, because it gives me some confidence as a coach or as a, as a consultant, as a physiologist, consultant, whatever title I decide to give myself that week. Um, it allows me to it allows me to say, OK, well, this athlete is very good at switching into that energy system. Now, if I've got someone who's trying to work really hard and the lactate's staying really low, that gives me some insight that, okay, well, they're not switching into that energy system. So they're still dominant on maybe fatty acids, which provide a lot of energy, loads of ATP, but the tap's much slower. It's dripping a lot slower. So that means that they might struggle to produce power and explosiveness quickly, which, for an example, sprinting isn't something that you want, 100, 200, 400 maybe 800 ish this is where the waters tend to get a bit muddied in terms of like what you want and percentages of lactate and when those systems should switch on um and then upwards to what you would call you know high rocks which is like you said a 60 to 90 minutes typically for most people which probably puts it more in the kind of aerobic endurance capacity so you want to make sure that these people aren't you know producing lactate really quickly um, and if they are well it's why and that's the real the the real important thing really and what i think that we we try to do is we try to look at a profile and don't just go, look, there's your profile. We say, okay, well, you're not producing lactate when you should be, or you are producing lactate, sorry, when you shouldn't be at lower intensities. Well, why is that? Okay, you haven't got a big enough aerobic base. So therefore, let's put some more, more aerobic base zone two training work in your in your program. And actually, we now know where your zone two actually is, because again, with heart rate data, that stuff is just is it, it can be very, very, very out depending on what someone's profile. And again, when I profile somebody, you very rarely get what's called textbook data. Like you very rarely get it. You know, some people have like a massive zone two physiologically, and then they basically have very little zone three and zone four. And then they're in this high intensity zone. And you're like, how did that happen? Some people have no zone two, but have got a massive zone three, big threshold, no zone five. So again, understanding that profile allows you to identify kind of strengths and weaknesses as an athlete. And the opposite is also true as well. So, for example, if someone's got like a massive zone two, they can hold quite a high intensity or high by intensity. What I'm talking about here is maybe speed or pace. So, you know, the running intervals within the, the high rocks event, they can hold quite a high pace without accumulating a lot of lactate, which is great. But then it might be that the second they've got to apply themselves to something which is more of like a power based section of the event, that as soon as they go over that certain number, their, their lactate shoots up way too quickly. The fatigue kicks in quickly, which means that well, they need to do more work at the upper end of the spectrum to balance the performance in what is a fundamentally an endurance sport, but with these little spikes, intermittent spikes of higher intensity demand. And that's helpful for two reasons. The first one I think I've alluded to is to say, does your profile already meet the demands of the sport and how can you improve that profile? And the second thing is, let's say then you go, okay, well, I want to improve X. We can now design training programs 
And then from that, we can then assess afterwards. And this is why a one-off test is useful, but it's probably better to think of this as something you should get done periodically, is in a few months, you can retest the profile. And then that curve hopefully is shifted to the right or to the left or a zone's increased or decreased, depending on what the specificity of the training program is to try and trigger that adaptation. And then the final kind of bit, which is the sort of what we hope doesn't happen, but does happen, but it's still useful, is that let's say we do a lactate test, profile your zones, work out what your energy system biases are. We then, you know, create some programming. We run that programming for six months. And all of a sudden you come back and test and nothing's changed, right? That very rarely happens, but it can happen. Um, and again, that's why I don't do any coaching with that anymore, apart from with my guys here, because that's not my responsibility, right? I just do the fun stuff. I just get to make people run sweat and make them bleed a little bit. I get to do the fun bits. Um, and so with that, if that doesn't change and something we had a sort of brief discussion around, I think at the time when we were doing a little debrief as you were cooling down, is if you at least understand your physiological strengths and weaknesses, you can then start to build a race pace strategy around those strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you're very, if you produce a lot of lactate, but your body's very good at buffering it. And again, I think it's important at this point, just to take a little science segue, if that's okay, which is that lactate isn't actually the issue. What happens is, is as we're trying to produce this ATP, if we get incomplete breakdown of the glycogen into the part of the machinery in the body that, produces the ATB, ATP, we get lactate produced. It's the incomplete breakdown of a glucose molecule. That's what lactate is. Um, and so that means that we're, the body is fine with lactate. Lactate is a fuel source. It can be taken up by other cells. It can be recycled in the body, in the liver, by a cycle called the Cori cycle. So lactate isn't the issue. The issue is, is that when we produce this lactate from incomplete glucose breakdown or glycogen breakdown, we get an associated hydrogen ion. So you hear this thing of like lactic acid, okay? Lactic acid exists for a very brief period within the cycle. Yeah, it's what people say. When they mean lactate, they often mean lactic acid. What they mean is it's the lactate dissociate, the lactic acid dissociates to lactate and the hydrogen, and it's the hydrogen that's the issue. Now, biologically or physiologically, it's very difficult to measure the hydrogen. But if you can think back to maybe GCSE chemistry, if you add hydrogen to stuff, it's a pH scale, the hydrogen scale, is that the more hydrogen there is, the more acidic there is. Acidity, our cells don't like that. Our cells like a nice, neutral, calm, homeostatic environment. So that's what basically we're using lactate as a proxy for hydrogen production. Now, this is where the waters can get muddied a little bit further because some people, like I've had conversations with people whose lactate have been off the scale high and they're having a conversation with you. They're not out of breath. They're not fatigued. They're not tired because their body seems to just be able to handle it and buffer it really well so again we can have this sort of textbook physiological understanding of what your metabolic profile might be but it's also important to be having conversations with you about well what are your perceived efforts within those zones because that might just not seem very much but it gives me some insight and other physiologists if they're good at their job some insight into be able to say okay well maybe this person is actually fine at higher intensities and then i've got other people who can be really out of breath really struggling and their lactate levels have barely got above baseline, which might mean that they don't produce a lot of lactate because their energy systems are so efficient, but they have really poor tolerance to, to the hydrogen accumulation as it were. So sorry for that little segue there. Um, I've lost my train of thought now. What was I saying? Um, <laughs> the science segue. So the, the, um, let's, let, let, let's talk about, sorry, let's talk about okay, yeah, um, yeah, uh, how, how like the, the, the test is executed and then okay. also how, someone might like want to find like their, their lactate threshold if they're not going to go for like blood testing or something like that. Is there like, are there other things that they can do? Okay. So um, how we determine lactate threshold is it can be mode specific. Okay. So if you're a cyclist, you don't want to do it on a treadmill. And if you're a runner, you don't want to do it on a bike. Basically mm -hmm. you can do a VO, uh, you can do a lactate test on basically any piece of equipment where you can basically standardize, standardize, standardizedly it's not a word you can standardize the increments of progression so for example the classic one is a run test so you start off with a very easy effort and then you take a small blood sample little pinprick you measure that measures your lactate and then what you do is you stay at that interval for around three to four minutes and then you would then increase the speed as you go so we took a measurement at six kilometers an hour eight clock like let's say it was six eight ten twelve fourteen sixteen now the, the the size of the increment you should take that measurement really depends on a person's fitness level 
for example, if someone's got no running ability and they can't do, say, a um, a sub 30 minute 5K, so six minutes per kilometer, I'm not going to start them at six kilometers an hour as a walk to take their first measurement and then go six, eight, 10. I'm not going to get enough data to really produce a hopefully reasonable curve or profile to actually be able to differentiate between where these different sections are. So that's what the test is. It's an incremental test to failure. There are other ways of um, there are other ways of using lactate in that regard. So you know, there's like uh, there's a way of kind of you set a standardized speed and then look at accumulation within that, and then how long you can you can sustain lactate at that level. That would be more kind of like specialist testing type stuff. But for people who are just looking to get a profile, that's basically the process. It is as simple as take a measurement run for a few minutes or cycle for a few minutes or ski erg for a few minutes at a given intensity, take another measurement, increase the intensity by a percentage that is relevant to where you think your threshold is going to be. And then you take that measurement for as long as you can physiologically tolerate. Typically speaking, it's it's I like to push people to a maximum test because I like to see the maximum amount of lactate they can accumulate. But in order to determine the kind of main two thresholds that we're, we're interested in, which then are then subdivided into the five other training zones that most people most people are more familiar with, um, there are really only two thresholds that we need to kind of delineate. But the more points we have after the second threshold in particular, the easier it is to kind of see where the curves go and the lines go and fit models and stuff and really technical boring stuff that practitioners should know how to do um <laughs> yeah so you know people can read uh read more about this like if, if people do want to read about what lactate testing is in a bit more depth if you just go to the athlete lab website there's a whole list of articles about lactate testing vo2 testing it's not a sales pitch there's just good articles on there because i wrote them i think they're good articles anyway we should simplify a lot of this stuff if i'm not making sense now but, but very very like high level sim simplicity simplistically speaking uh, like the the two lactate thresholds, like LT one and LT two, you're mm -hmm. you're looking, at, you're, you're you're testing the blood of people at, at different speeds on on the mm -hmm. treadmill, for example, uh, and when it reaches certain levels of lactate in the blood, that's like LT one and LT two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's 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 a, a much less rambly way than I would have described it. So congratulations. There you go. You can take my job now. So basically, <laughs> and, if and, and sorry, I, I I'll just I'll just add, and then like LT two, which is like I think where maybe some people think of like lactate threshold. Like at that point is where there's a a dramatic increase in lactate in the blood. Is that is that fair to say? That's supposed to be where there's a dramatic increase in lactate in the blood. <laughs> um, so again, this is one of the interesting things. So what you've described there is absolutely perfect as a description. And if we were to take a textbook example, what you see is the first increments of your intensity. So let's just say it was like 6, 8, 10, 12, easy numbers, 6, 8, 10, 12. And then what will start to happen is you get this gradual increase in lactate, very slight gradual increase in lactate here at maybe 12, 14, 16. I'm talking like a, a very good level runner here for the with these speeds 12 14 16 and so lt1 is that point at just which you get this first gradual increase okay so we're still in an aerobic dominant system with this first increase but we're just starting to shift into what we call those glycogen dominant pathways so we're switching from fat as a fuel source to more glycogen carbohydrates blood glucose type stuff then what happens is you get to this a certain speed where you get the second much steeper inflection point lactate turn point um and in an ideal world, you get this beautiful gradual and then an inflection point. And that point there is LT2. And that would be what most people would commonly know it as your kind of that would be your threshold or your um, your anaerobic threshold. So once you're over that intensity, you're starting to accumulate lactate at a rate at which it's not being cleared. And therefore, you're accumulating hydrogen at a rate that is likely not being cleared. And therefore, the body systems then start to run out of. Um, there's not enough oxygen present in the body, sorry, to meet energy demand from using full aerobic pathways. So don't forget aerobic can both be fatty acids, so stored fat in the body, and aerobic can be carbohydrates. But carbohydrates are the only fuel source that can be can produce ATP without the presence of oxygen. So that's why that lactate's in, um, in that second threshold is important. It kind of relates back to what I was saying earlier about the incomplete breakdown of glycogen. It, it, that's why we get the lactate. Um, and then that's just being pumped out into the bloodstream, being circulated, and that's what we measure. So that second threshold 
in a perfectly textbook example. So if you just Google any, if your listeners now just Google like lactate threshold, they will see these two distinct points. The second point is what most people are were previously obsessed with because it's that sort of aerobic anaerobic crossover. So how you differentiate, but but in more recently because of people like Peter Atia and a lot of people talking about the benefits of zone two training, which does have huge benefits. A lot of people have now become obsessed with this first LT1 threshold, this first sort of turn point or first um, first threshold value, simply because that is the end point for zone two, physiologically speaking. Interestingly, in sports science, if you ever read any articles on this, we only really use a three zone system, not a five zone system, because, for example, your zone four, as we've discussed previously, is a bit sort of like you've got this one threshold value, but as a zone, it's this sort of slightly ethereal. It's a little bit this way. It's a little bit that way, depending on what method you use to determine where that threshold is. And there is more than one method. Um, it might be a little bit faster or a little bit slower, or your heart rate might be a little bit higher or a little bit lower. So that's why it's the zone is there as a buffer. Whereas like a lot of the other zones actually are a little bit more easier to define. So interestingly, although we've got this perfect graph in our mind the reality of practice is that sometimes it's not quite that um quite that clear cut to be able to say right okay well that's definitely where lt2 is and lt1 is exactly the same you know people's data pinballs around the place so we have to create you know averages moving averages across the course of a graph for example um so yeah that's that second threshold really is where a lot of people are interested in or previously but now i think increasingly with the the more awareness of zone two training um, and that sort of base building, as it were, with the frustrations of more people wearing wearable tech. Um, I love my Garmin. It's great. Keeps me safe and out of trouble in the wilderness. But the reality is that I have a naturally high starting heart rate. And there's different reasons why that can be the case. Some people just have a naturally higher heart rate once they start exercise. It might be an energy system bias thing. It might be a, a cardiac output thing because obviously we're thinking about all of these energy systems fundamentally what it's about is driving oxygen delivery we need oxygen to produce atp and when we don't have enough we go anaerobic that's where that threshold is um so you know a lot of people like myself if i was to take my training zones based off this off max heart rate and even minimum heart rate and looking at heart rate reserve type stuff which is just your maximum minus your minimum and then you divide that up into zones based off the science you're basically taking an approximation of lots of data to apply it to yourself as an individual rather than what lactate testing does is takes your individual data and applies it to you as an individual. Um, so I know, for example, my heart rate zones for this are way off. Um, I think that sort of leads into the question that you sort of asked, but um, which was like, if you don't want to go for testing, how do you determine where these zones may or may not be? The, so just, there's, just there's, before you get yeah, into that, on. let me, let, I'll, I'll just say, so you, you come up with like LT1, LT2, mm -hmm. uh, but just this is for people listening, but uh, it, it helps to essentially determine like the appropriate level of intensity or pacing for your workout, whatever the aim of that workout is. And if the intention yeah. is for it to be an easy run zone two, then yeah. you get this LT1 level that ideally you would stay slightly below, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and and then similarly, if you wanted to do like this threshold session, again, like you, you ideally want to stay like, slightly below that lt2 level or pacing hmm. because as soon as you go above it the fatigue cost and like the the, yeah. the increase yeah, in yeah. lactate in the body and the fatigue cost of that session um becomes much higher than it would if you managed to stay slightly below it is that fair to say no that's that's absolutely spot on and so I think, again, someone else is in terms of elite runners who's really started to popularize this idea is uh, Jacob Ingebrigtsen. Inge I can never pronounce his name. Yeah. And so if you look at this like Norwegian method, they will do like double threshold days where they're doing like basically two different thresholds. They're doing a threshold session, which is like at their, near their LT1, the first threshold, and then like a second threshold session where they're near their LT2. And the reason that they they will actually measure their blood lactate on the track whilst they're doing it to determine pace. Well, why might you do that? Um, the answer to that is it's it's actually quite ingenious. And in terms of the outcomes that they're getting, that's great. Whether that's because of the actual process or they're just buying into it. And it's, you know, whether it's actually, you know, it's difficult when you've got an elite level athlete, whatever you do to them, people are going to sort of put that under the microscope. And, and it's difficult to know because you've got no other comparison groups to know if it was actually the method that was effective or this this person's genetic freak. And you could have got them doing any program and they, they would have been fine. 
But one of the things they do cleverly, which to me makes like sense scientifically in terms of understanding of physiology, is it's sort of like when you're trying to fundamentally you're trying to drive as much training volume as you can and in much adaptation as you can with minimizing fatigue. So for example, if you were just doing an interval session, a high intensity interval session, and you had no idea of where these thresholds were, the chances are that you're going to maximize your the the time that you spend in this red zone, like you know, your higher intensity zone. But the fatigue cost for the adaptation cost is 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 you know it's this fatigue stimulus to fatigue ratio is what we're called so what we want in training particularly in a multimodal sport so like i work with fighters for example is if they've got a running session i want them to turn on their adapt adaptation switch so think of it like a dimmer switch i want them to turn on the adaptation switch as much as i possibly can before i burn out the switch or burn out the light bulb because i can't turn it on all of the way because mm -hmm. great i'm going to get all of the adaptation but I'm going to get all of the fatigue with it, which might affect the rest of their training. But if I can get 90% of the adaptation, but with much less fatigue, then that allows me to have more weekly volume and accumulate more volume at those intensities and those effort levels. So that's where this stuff really gets quite clever. And that's what I think like Inga Britson and his coaching team and a lot of um, the, I think a lot of the like Norwegian um, Ironman type stuff as well. They do, a, and, and triathlon stuff, sorry. They do a lot of this kind of work because what it does is they they admit or they would probably acknowledge that maybe they're not fully turning on that machinery for the high intensity adaptations, but it's on enough that allows them to compensate with volume. It's the same as strength training as like you don't need to train to failure to get most of the adaptations. If you're one or two reps from failure and you're still training quite hard and you know what real failure is, you'll get most of the muscle gain adaptations, but with just that little restriction in fatigue. So again, endurance work I do here with my athletes, strength work I do here with my athletes, none of it is to failure. You know, if I get them doing a running session, I ask them to go never above an eight, eight, eight or nine out of 10 RPE. And that would be rare that I got them above an eight, you know, and then what we'll do is we'll hold them at an eight or an effort level or heart rate zone or whatever it is. And I always assess the heart rate zone afterwards. And I will say, right, okay, well, that was, you were spending for this session, you were spending too much time in, in the red zone when we were meant to be, you know, longer duration here or to not so much in the red zone. That's probably not right. Too much time at maximum heart rate, like really hammering it. Whereas actually we only needed you to be at like 90 to 95% maximum heart rate, you know, and, and to build volume there. So yeah, what you said is, is absolutely right. And having those zones and being able to target those zones a bit more specifically means that you don't have to go, or maybe you want to, maybe it's a part of your psyche and maybe it's what you enjoy. Personal preference comes into this as well and how people like to train and balance in that. But at the end of the day, the more volume, one thing we know from looking at endurance sports is like the more volume you can accumulate, safely without injury and without overtraining the better and this is just a very effective way to be able to accumulate a lot of volume at very specific intensities and so when you think of these zones you're there's always like a volume intensity trade-off so the the lower the intensity work the longer the duration can be so the more relative volume that we can do it's not an exact metric but if you think of your workload for a session and i hate the term workload because it's got very specific scientific and engineering connotations so my old biomechanics supervisor would kick me for saying this but if we think of work as a summation of like the intensity at which you're operating times the duration then you know if you're doing three hours at a three out of ten effort that might only, that might be the same as 30 minutes at a nine out of ten effort but you're accumulating a lot more mileage and a lot more volume and of course the specific adaptations that are taking place across the range of those zones um i think sometimes people really do overly obsess though on where these zones are on these cutoffs like, for example, if you're in zone two and you creep over to zone three, all of a sudden the adaptations from zone two are gone. It's like, no, it's not it's not binary. It's not on and off. It's, you know, all endurance modalities will cause all of the adaptations. It's just the likelihood of specificity of those adaptations that shifts. But the main one, like you said there, which is which is a really good reason for doing this kind of not necessarily testing in terms of the blood lactate, but understanding these things is that sometimes it's better to finish a session and be like have completed all of your intervals and be like a seven or eight out of 10 level of fatigue and be able to run the next day then going full send setting a new pr trying to set a new pr every week and then all of a sudden wondering why the rest of your, your rest of your training for the week is in the toilet because yeah. you've just you've gone over that threshold you know yeah yeah uh okay so if um if people can't or don't want to go for 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 testing with blood and things like that are there things that you can do on the track or the treadmill to to help determine these zones 
so there's a there's a couple of there's a couple of really basic simple ones which are which are about as close to one's a bit more scientific and one's very simplistic so we'll go with the simplistic one first so basically the the first one is the torque test so as well as lactate threshold there's these things called ventilatory thresholds and ventilatory thresholds correlate quite well with the lactate thresholds all ventilation is is breathing rate so we get these two chain distinct changes in breathing rate that correspond to shockingly lt1 first lactate and lt2 doing that in terms of measuring oxygen we can do that in the lab with our mask with our vo2 there are some methodological issues with that depending on the bit of equipment that you use so we do sort of look for changes in like you get these dynamic changes in oxygen consumption breathing rate and things as well but that's the scientific way the simple way to do it is what's called the torque test so basically if you can run and have a full conversation with somebody without having to stop your breathing and you're and 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 therefore you're probably in your zone too right now for some people that will really upset them because what they'll find is any kind of once they get break from a walk to a trot say they might have to um they might have to accept they're not in zone two that's a different conversation whether zone two is right for everybody my answer to that is very different to a lot of people's out there um, I don't think that zone two is necessarily what everybody should be targeting initially if they can't stay in a zone two. It's like if you can't stay in zone two and you feel the benefit of going for a 30 minute run, you're going to get faster going for a 30 minute zone three run than a 30 minute walk because you're going to get more economical at running. I think a lot of people need to build an amount of fitness before they have a reasonably sized zone, zone two. Mm-hmm. But again, that's, that's a different conversation for a different time. Sorry. I just felt like that was important because I'd said O2, zone two is important and people fixate on words and then get stressed when they can't stay in zone two. Mm-hmm. Don't overthink it. Um, the the talk test is a great way because you will know pretty quickly whether you have a zone two or not. And so zone two would be um, having a conversation, walking along. Zone three and four, and by the way, scientifically in the research, when we define these training zones, we only really design uh, define three zones. We have zone one, which is before, which is zone two, if that makes sense, before LT1. We have zone two, which is between LT1 and LT2, which is zone three and four in a five zone system. Gets confusing this. And then zone three, which is the high intensity zone, which is zone five in a five zone system. That's all we really care about because, again, the adaptations are quite hazy across the board. So when if you're if you're then able to run ski erg row whatever it is that you're doing and you can talk but you can't quite talk in full sentences you keep having to stop every few words to do that you're probably in your zone three and four Mm -hmm. in terms of running and then threshold would be at the upper end of that where you're at that breaking point between being able to have a conversation and it being uncomfortable and not being able to have a conversation where you're like, for the first minute, you might be able to hold a conversation, but then you're like, actually, stop talking to me now. This is starting. I need to concentrate on my running. Yeah. So that's mm-hmm. the talk test. The other one which you can then correlate with that, which is obviously when we did your testing, is this idea of like a, just a simple one to 10 scale and sort of asking yourself, you know, if you do a maximal test on a treadmill where you start at six and go all the way up and you ask how hard you find each one, usually uh, around about a six or a seven is where the threshold is so i always have I, I try and dial people into that it's a bit more perceptual a bit more vague but you'd be surprised at how accurate at least when people have got a bit of experience running how accurate their perception of effort is relative to the speed at which they're traveling so you can do it on a perceptual be- base so for example zone two might be you're at like a three to five out of 10 effort that second threshold is usually a six to eight for most people you know, but that requires a little bit of self-reflection and self-honesty. It's a little le- less physiological. And the other way you can do it, which is a little bit more, I guess, uh, data-driven and scientific is give yourself like a 30-minute test. So you're going to do an all-out maximum 30-minute kind of effort. Try and evenly pace it. Don't burn out. And discard the first 10 minutes data. And then it's like kind of like your average. So then set lap at like 10 minutes and then take your average heart rate over the last 20 minutes. That would usually give you a good proxy for what your lt2 would be and the reason for that is simple because if you look at the durations of if you look at the durations of of how long we can hold that lt2 on that cusp of anaerobic zones for it's usually between 30 and 60 minutes you can do it for an hour if you want but 30 minutes is usually enough as a good starting point okay so that's how i would determine the second threshold the first threshold is a lot more difficult to to obtain that way because it's a lot it's a lot less clear delineation. Like, you know the difference between running at a sustainable pace, even if it's hard, for 15 to 20 minutes and knowing when you've overcooked that. To know whether you're in zone two or whether you've crept into zone three, 
probably is a bit more difficult, but I also think it's probably a lot less important unless you are genuinely trying to target specific adaptations. So that's the thing for me. Like I don't push lactate people on people say like everybody needs it. Of course you don't. Like I don't run, I've got access to the kit and I don't run it for myself all the time because I know where my strengths and my weaknesses are. And I also know that perceptually, and I've got confidence in this because I have done lactate testing on myself, that my perception of zone two is better than using my heart rate data for zone two for knowing I'm in there. So I generally just ignore my Garmin um, for, for that sort of stuff. So that would be the three main ways I would look at it and, and a good way of determining that second sort of threshold for yourself if you wanted to go from the simplest to the one that's going to be not exactly difficult, but takes a bit of consideration and commitment to go in and doing a fairly reasonable 30 minute all out test with, again, as a general guideline, try and do it where you're not being dragged along with someone else's pacing so you can pace yourself as well. Uh, like you see these things, the, the the could be a big determinant on terms of going off too hard too soon or like don't do it as part of a park run or anything like that, even though it might be nice to go and do that. And um, try and do it like on your own in a fairly stable static environment um, so that you can really regulate your pace, real pace properly. And whilst you're doing that with the RPE thing, keep dialing in with yourself. Okay, I'm at this pace now. I think this is a sustainable pace. Is this a six or is this a seven? And then you can just, just adjust up or downwards, whether that's on the road or on a treadmill is 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 up to you really um but yeah okay. there's benefits to both okay I, th- I think you've touched on it there really but one of the questions i, I was going to have like obviously i came to to your gym and, and we tested on a on a certain treadmill and then i'm going to go and like train on a completely different treadmill in a different gym and like obviously all treadmills are slightly different um so like the the question really was like th- th- does it have does it translate very well but i guess i guess the point is that you were you were not only testing my lactate levels in the blood, but it was like also heart rates at those levels. Yeah. And then also mm-hmm. like the RPE. And yeah. I guess like I need to take all those three things into consideration when I go back and I'm trying to run at, you know, X speed was like, well, is that right? That, you know, how does my heart rate tie to, to when we did the testing? How does like my RPE tie as well at the same time? Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. And it's also important to note that, you know, your perception of effort versus your heart rate might be off. And that's usually, you know, the the more you look into this data and the more conversations you have with people around this sort of stuff and the more, you know, your, your, your viewers dig into this, you'll find that sometimes like, well, maybe your heart rate's like really high for your perception of effort early on. So your breathing rate's not there, but your heart rate's a little bit high. Well, what is that? Am I over fatigued? Do I need a rest day? Have I had too much caffeine? Mm -hmm. You know, Paces become almost irrelevant anyway as soon as you take things, even within the high rocks, it's it's an indoor. But if you've got a slight, if you're doing it on a track versus doing it on an AstroTurf, doing it on a, you know, the, all of those things are going to have a little impact on your sort of pacings and stuff like that. Um, so although, you know, th- there's got to, there's always got to be a little bit of, once you understand the data and what it's meant to represent, there's got to be a little bit of internal calibration that goes on there. But actually, if you, if you can take a, you know, a sort of data-driven approach to your training, then you will know if you're doing the same routes in fairly similar conditions, the heart rate zones aren't going to change too much. So if you notice that you're doing your zone two run and all of a sudden your heart rate is, after an hour is meant to be at say, you know, 130 beats a minute and your heart rate's at 140 after an hour, there's a fair chance that there's a reason for that. Your body's accumulated a lot more training, fatigue and stress. And that means that we can then make different decisions about how our programming might look for the rest of the week. So, you know, you can you can monitor fatigue. You know, people use things like HRV and this and that and the other and all this stuff. But like, you know, more simple metrics, resting heart rate of a morning, your heart rate response after a warm up is usually a good one, like how quickly it comes. So if you do like a standardized five minute warm up and all of a sudden your heart rates and you know it takes a minute for your heart rate to go from, say, 150 beats a minute back down to 120 if that's taking a little bit longer, okay, you might be carrying a little bit extra fatigue here. Let's just have a little think about how I feel. So you've got all this perceptual stuff and much simpler metrics than than we actually need to. But again, it just requires you as an athlete, as the global you, you or as a viewer, to just say, actually, you know what? Like, this is actually meaningful to me and when it's meaningful, which for a lot of people is, is a lot of time. But me, I'm a super data-driven person. So it's like, yeah, you know, I, I measure my resting heart rate pretty consistently like two or three days a week i try and get my athletes here to do it which is a bit challenging because you know priorities and stuff depending on where they've got to be training travel stuff like that and that's the other thing like if you're at high rocks has got events all over the place if you're traveling you can have a look at the effects of how sleep's affected your resting heart rate how sleep's affected your training zones 
it's really natural in competition as well. I think this is an important one that like, if you're a bit nervous or anxious, your heart rate's going to be a little bit higher anyway. So we just need to be aware of how, where heart rate might fail us. It might be good for training, but in competition, we might need to make adjustments for that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, things like that can have a massive, a massive impact. Uh, and then people will panic and go slower. It's like, no, no, just trust your perception. So all of these things are an interplay with each other. And the more we understand ourselves, um, one of the things that I'm a big believer in is like being your own scientist, you know, collect the data, but data without insight is meaningless. So like we try and offer as much insight as we can in our reports and recommendations and in our conversations, but ultimately you have to have some form of like self-reflection within yourself to be like, okay, like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is, this is, this is useful or not useful. No, sorry, not useful or not useful. In what ways it's useful and in what ways it might be less useful or when it might be more or less useful. I think that yeah. makes sense. Sorry, okay. it's been a long day. Okay. Need more, <laughs> nearly time for my afternoon coffee, I think. <laughs> uh, no, that's, that, that's great. And then, I mean, to be honest, we could probably geek out on this all day. Um, uh, I, I, know, I know we're coming up to time here a little bit. So um, maybe if, if, if someone, maybe this is an unfair question to, to finish <laughs> on, but if, if someone wants to, let's say, like you want to improve the speed at which uh, of your LT2, like your lactate threshold, you want to improve that speed because you think that's going to be beneficial for you in a high rocks race. Are there like, one, two, three things that spring to mind that someone can be doing if that's their goal? Step number one, which are usually very quick wins, um, away from the sort of specific training stuff, which I think, you know, spend more time at that zone um, would be useful. Or if you can't spend time at that zone, then you're going to have to build a bigger aerobic base. Again, it's difficult to answer that without seeing someone's individual profile about what it is they're lacking in that profile. Mm -hmm. But two absolute givens that I would say are there is that one is get someone to look at your running technique and your economy. It makes a massive difference. I've seen some people with huge engines who run like baby rhinos. And it's like that you to look at their, you look at their VO2 max and that, sorry, their paces for a 5k or a 20 minute time trial. You'd be like, how is, how are you that slow? And conversely, how are you that fast? So gets, if you're not, improving something like you know there's lots of stuff out there just even on youtube you can get like you just make some video analysis look at some of the people out there who do like gate analysis and running stuff every person is going to have their own individual gate but there are some principles that we should follow so i would say get someone to look at your economy of movement generally speaking um you know skill like running is a skill believe it or not and people should treat it as such and learn to do it properly particularly for beginners the second thing really which is a very quick win is and again, I'm not in the business of pushing people towards just being lean for lean sake. And again, being lean and won't necessarily make you faster. But there's a reason why endurance athletes are obsessed with weight. And if you are carrying an excess of fat mass, and I'll leave that in the ethereal sense of excess, because some people think an excess of fat mass is like 10%, depending on what the biases are. But if you can look yourself in the mirror and say, I really want to improve my performance as quickly as possible. If you've got, say, an extra five or 10 kilo of fat mass on your body, you're basically running with a fat backpack. It's going to make you slower. So I would say that it's not necessarily the, the most fun or easy, or it's one of the quickest ways to improve, but not quickest in the sense that you should follow a crash diet or any nonsense like that. But in terms of body composition changes incorporated with doing some strength training, you know, strength training has been shown to improve running economy by, I don't know what the exact percentages are, but a significant percentage very quickly plyometric drills leaps hops jumps bounds stuff like that so i would say in terms of external physiological changes other than just targeting the training you know i understand for high rocks that you have to have a certain amount of muscle mass because you have to be able to carry stuff throw stuff so we can't just be super super tiny because you know if i'm carrying a i don't know like a 10 kilo, let's say I'm carrying, I don't know what the weights are, I've forgotten, sorry. But if I'm doing a lunge with a certain amount of weight and that's 50% of my body fat, body fat, body mass, that's going to feel a lot heavier than if it's 25%, right? So we st- we need to have an amount of muscle, which means that we've got to generally, for most sports, optimization of body composition is important unless you get up to like the super heavyweight powerlifter kind of guy, that guys, which is like just mass moves, mass type stuff, okay? Um, so I would say that we're in that regard. Like not to say that everyone's got to be like, you know, 10% super shredded, super lean, super athlete fitness model. But if there is an, if there's, there's a quick win to be had in terms of pacing, I know, for example, myself, that when I'm, when I'm in my more of a a strength based phase of my cycle, uh, training cycle as a, as a hybrid athlete, my paces are 15 to 20 seconds per kilometer slower 
at my heaviest weights over the course of the year than they are when I'm at my lightest, which yeah. is a significant amount of difference for no fit for very little fitness gain. And I know that because, you know, like I can test the physiological performance elements and my train, even if my training hasn't been going particularly well or not been doing much running just on maintenance mode training wise, I drop that extra body fat and all of a sudden everything just feels a bit easier. And particularly the longer duration you go, the more important that's going to get because with every step comes more fatigue. So you might get away with it over a 5k, but when it starts getting up to like 10k distances or high rocks duration, 60, 90 minutes, there's a reason why, you know, most elite level marathon runners are, under 60 kilos or 60 to 65 kilos right yeah. and there's a reason why power at like 3000 5000 meters 1500s are a bit heavier because they need those powerful muscle fibers so what i'm saying is don't chase a low weight at all costs think about where your body composition is and optimize your body composition for performance as best you can but also within the constraints of like still having a life and stuff like if getting to below 15 percent body fat sucks for you because it means that you you, you know you're missing out on things and don't do it like depends what level of athlete that you're at so i'm going to put the take this with a level of athlete that you want to be caveat you know the more elite you want to be the more of these factors you have to take into consideration and yeah in terms of the actual performance on a treadmill type stuff understand your profile if you struggle to maintain let's say your your hypothesized lt2 for say seven or eight minutes straight out the gate comfortably your lt2 is either too high or you haven't got a big enough endurance base, so you spend more time just doing long, slow, steady runs. Um, okay. And conversely, probably polarize that with some higher effort runs to get more economy. Oh, final one, do some sprint training. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> sprint training, how often would you uh, sprint train for something like high rocks, which is, you know, you, you know the distance, you know the, the length of time. Do you, th- you still think sprint training is important for something like that? I still, I still think sprint training is important from the economy and efficiency perspective. So I wouldn't use it as like a sprint interval training style session where you're trying to fatigue yourself. But I would say doing, you know, like a few, like two, like, you know, a couple of kilometers of 200 meter repeats with good rest intervals, full recovery in, in, in between will help with things like cur- turnover, foot strike, particularly if you can get down to the local athletics tr- club as well and get someone, one of the coaches to have a look at you, that will really help. You'd be surprised at how much difference that can make. Um, but yeah, so I wouldn't put that on the top of the list in terms of things to do compared to the other stuff. But I definitely think that if you've got the time to go and do some sprint training under supervision to look at your economy and efficiency, um, then yeah, sorry. Roosten's Rooster, just walked in now and he's four, mate. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'd say that's useful. Okay. All right. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you for this. It's been it's been brilliant. And maybe, maybe we'll get you back on again sometime and we'll have another geek out on, on the other bits we've not uh, talked about. But um, if people want to follow you, find out more about you, find out more about your testing, where's, where's the best place to go? Um, so my business address is uh, www.athletelab.uk. Um, not co- not dot co dot uk just dot uk uh athlete athlete lab uk is the instagram handle and my personal instagram is at the performance strategist because i hate the word consultant <laughs> <laughs> so, generally the only reason um which is you where you'll usually find very little other than just bits of my nonsense training and occasionally the people that i work with if anyone wants to stalk any of that stuff all right, amazing. Thank you. And uh brilliant. No, thank, you, thank you for having yeah, thank you for having me on. And um yeah, any any questions or anything anyone wants to reach out to, you can get my emails at contact at athletelab.uk as well if they want to get in touch about any questions or testing or they're not sure or anything like that.